Is it, uh, is my voice showing like uh, when I talk? Yeah. Okay. All right, so how'd you do with this uh, numerical analysis problem? Um, the formula maybe, maybe was a stumbling block, but did you think about it? I gave you a hint that it was the area of a triangle essentially times 12. In other words, area times the third dimension gives volume. But the area of a triangle, you can just grab that side angle side formula, one half AB sine theta. Okay, now again, if you had trouble with this, I realize you couldn't finish it, but one half of uh, the two sides, two and two, and then the sine of theta. Now that's perfect because the problem is supposed to be in terms of theta. So we don't know what theta is, and we notice that this formula uses theta. Okay, if you, you always want to simplify. Turns out that it becomes a really nice, comfy 24 sine of theta. I'll, I'll share if you didn't, again, if you didn't get here, make sure that you're still experiencing the problem. To experience the problem, maybe you're going to graph it. If you uh, didn't get to this point, you can type this in, you can graph it. I'm going to show you the graph, but sometimes the graph is what gives kids trouble because you have to think about the window. Okay, X would be the same as theta, so your window probably can go from 0 to 180 if you think about possible angles in the triangle. Now the Y window is really the volume. We don't really know what that answer is, but if you go from up to 30, you'll see what you need to see. As we said yesterday, try not to go too high. That way you won't zoom out too far. Now this graph you know, maybe it's not a big surprise. It's just part of a sine wave that has an amplitude of 24. Okay, so that's why our graph is able to be seen, and it looks like the highest point is 24, which might not be a surprise if you think about the amplitude, and that happens at 90 degrees. So we make a little answer. We make a little answer that says the maximum volume is 24 cubic feet, and that happens at 90 degrees. This particular problem, if you step back, you would say, yeah, that's always going to be the biggest triangle, basically a right triangle. Could you have decided that without all this fancy math? Sure. But I wanted to use this as a problem that's a little easier, and the answer we can say makes sense even geometrically. A right triangle always gives you the largest space. Something that you want to ask about? Something beyond what I showed you here? Anything with the calculator? All right. Now, we're not going to do numerical analysis today. We're going to shift gears to just a different application. But on Monday, you guys will get an assignment that specifically focuses on numerical analysis. And then it will focus on our next topic, which is harmonic motion. Okay, we're going to talk about harmonic motion. It's a little bit of a physics idea. Um, it depends on if you've taken or will take that there will be some stuff we talk about here that's supposed to help you kind of say, oh, that's why it works that way. Sometimes when you're doing physics downstairs, it's maybe a little simplified or maybe we're leaving out a component, but I'm trying to teach you a little more of the theory so when you go upstairs, you know, you can apply it. Okay? Um, do you have a book? If not, Take a good picture of those two pages. I'll give you a couple moments to get yourself situated. Also, we're going to flip over to the next page of your notes where you should see that it says simple harmonic motion. Now, just by the way, if you're like, I'm not taking physics, it's okay. You don't have to understand anything about this to be able to learn from this lesson. But sometimes students will be able to make some connections, depending on your science plans, um, with again, with your classes. Can I have the back part of this paper? Yeah, I only printed out. I printed out a whole slide. We have like a front video part. You sure can. Now, this is all four sides. Okay. 
because I too was trying to save paper and such, so I condensed it all in there. All right, look at the top of your notes paper, just a simple sentence and kind of gets us focused and has a little fill in the blank. It says the periodic nature, if you want to fill in the blank periodic, the periodic nature of our trig functions. Okay, now I'm talking about how sine, cosine, and tangent repeat themselves, something that you've seen over and over. Well, that's useful for describing the motion. That's the fill in the blank. It's useful for describing the motion. So again, you can fill in the blank with the word motion or position of an object that vibrates, oscillates, or moves in a wave motion. To say it another way, something that moves up and down, something that moves up and down can be described with a sine wave. And we basically call that harmonic motion. Now, I want to show you a couple YouTube clips to just kind of give you a little more of a visual of what I'm describing here. This one's a classic. Okay, this is the spray paint oscillator. It's kind of old school. And if you're kind of like, what is going on here? Just take a look. Okay, we have this apparatus. It's a spray paint can attached to a long spring. There's a roll of paper behind it, you'll see. And here there's a piece of string or a long piece of string that's coiled. Now the spray paint can is on a spring, which you'll find out is a perfect example of something that moves in a harmonic motion as it goes up and down. We pull the string, the paper moves, and you get a sine wave. Okay, and you can make one of those in your garage this weekend. But it is true, you get a sine wave when something moves in that motion. And here's kind of the same thing, just a little bit more digital. When something moves in an up and down harmonic motion, it can always be modeled with a sine wave. It's kind of interesting how you can see how when it gets to the top, how it kind of slows down, slows down, speeds up in the middle. And if you think about the nature of that sine wave, it kind of illustrates the same thing, how it slows down at the top and bottom. Of course, right in the middle, it has that, you'll learn in calculus next year, it has that steepest slope right in the middle. All right, and this kind of goes on endlessly because it's just digital. Okay, so that's what we're talking about with harmonic motion. Um, now, let me encourage you to take a look in your book, just a little read. It's not a bad read, so actually read it on page 323, okay? And then there's a blue box on page 324. Now, you actually don't have to really write anything down. I just kind of want you to read it, okay? Don't feel like you have to write anything down. And then the blue box on page 324. There's a couple illustrations in the middle. Look, look at them. See if you can understand the text that is written below each of those diagrams. And then make sure you look at the blue box on the next page.
All right. Now, I just kind of, I just wanted you to be able to read. You may have read some things that sound similar to uh, the simple videos that you saw. Um, we're going to debunk this a little bit. Again, just some of this you can just continue to listen. Um, but I do want to let you know the harmonic motion, because it can be modeled with a sine wave. Well, the formula for harmonic motion will be then the following. It'll be that the displacement will always equal A sine of WT. And you'll probably want to put this in that little empty box in your notes. So the formula for harmonic motion, it will be a sine wave. Or you'll discover it could be a cosine wave. As we've discussed, that of course a sine and a cosine wave really can be can describe the same thing. Okay, they just represent a little different starting point. What you're going to find out is how we choose whether we're going to use sine or cosine. Again, depending on the starting point. Okay, now just depending on where you're at with some of these science words, displacement, displacement. That's always like a distance. It's always a distance from a starting point. Our starting point is going to be equilibrium. Okay, now equilibrium would be where the object would be when it was resting. Now, if you want to add a little bit of that, you can. Again, I said the D is the displacement. And displacement is really nothing more than a distance that an object will travel from its starting point. But our starting point is going to be equilibrium, which is where the object would be if it was at rest. Now, some of those words that I just said have direct connections to our sine and cosine graphs. And I want to help you to see that by continuing to kind of debunk some of this language. Okay. First off, the word amplitude, did that kind of sound like, let me stop a second here, amplitude's going to be A, of course, it's the number in front of sine or cosine. But did amplitude kind of sound like displacement? Well, that's because it is. The amplitude is the max displacement. It's how far the object is able to move from equilibrium. And did equilibrium kind of sound like something? Well, it is. It's the midline. You might want to add that in a little bit of that blank space. Okay, what you're going to walk out of here with today is realizing that every part of these equations relates specifically to a part of that harmonic movement. In other words, an object moving up and down. So the amplitude relates directly to the displacement, a distance from the middle. Now, a sine graph, a sine graph is always used when basically you start at a displacement of zero. What that means is you're starting at the origin. Okay, that's how a sine graph has always been. But a cosine graph is used when you start at a displacement of A. That's a little fancy, but that just means that when you start either at the top or at the bottom. Okay, and that's also how cosine has always been you'll learn that you're going to choose a positive or negative A depending on the initial movement. Now, a positive or a negative, we learned back when we were doing the theory of graphing, is going to cause our graph to reflect. And you'll find out that that also means that the graph can change going up or down. Now, I'm going to show you all this with a sketch. And it's when you see the sketch, I think the light will go off and you'll say, I see. Everything's in radians. Okay, everything's in radians because when we think about the period as being uh, uh, 2 pi over w, we use a radian numerator. Okay, so the period is 2 pi over w. Now make sure you make the connection that that's the same thing we learned in the chapter, except instead of using the letter k, we're using the letter w. Just something a little different, but it's still the same formula. 
Now, a period is going to be a full cycle of an up and down motion. If you picture the spray paint can or that, that uh, digital uh, weight that was moving up and down, a period is going to have to go the whole way up and the whole way down and back to the middle, just like it's always been. Frequency. You read about it a little bit on page 323. Okay, There's two ways to define frequency. One way is to define it as the reciprocal of period, literally flipping and putting it as W over 2 pi, so the reciprocal of period, or by literally saying 1 over the period. Okay, so we can define it as 1 over the period because it's the reciprocal, or we can define it as W over 2 pi because it's the reciprocal. Now, this is kind of one of those things where if you've had exposure to frequency, it might make it a little easier, but you got to be careful no matter what that you don't say that the frequency is the period. It's related to the period, but it's not the same. The frequency is always going to be the number of cycles I get through per second. It's always per one second, okay, because of the nature of it simplifying to be one over the period. So what happens if my period gets smaller, okay, if the spray paint can is moving up and down more quickly, so my graph gets squished. So as the period gets smaller, the number of cycles I go through is going to get bigger, right? So smaller period, larger frequency. Smaller period, bigger frequency. What that means is I get through more cycles per second. That object's going to be moving up and down really quickly. Now, all that information is 100% true, okay? But it can be used to create these graphs. And this is kind of where it's at. These sketches, we're going to have three of them, and there's a little bit of space in your notes. I know it's kind of a little, but see if you can not write too big. So what we're going to do is we're going to take each of these situations and kind of sketch them. You say, what do you mean situations? Well, we have a situation where the basically the weight starts at equilibrium okay so right now the weight is in the middle and if you're able to sketch this i'm going to show you a little more maybe you want to see a little more before you draw too much if the object goes up so if there's a force that pushes up on the weight that can be modeled with a graph that goes up I think that you're going to put it um, above example one. There's kind of like a blank space between. Now, listen carefully, because if the object is going to start by going up, then you need a graph that starts by going up. What kind of graph does that? Ah, a positive sine wave. Now, that's kind of like the first thing we ever learned. That's what a sine wave has always done. But I want you, to, and I want you to kind of see all of this so you understand where I'm going with this. If the object starts by going down, in other words, there's a force that pushes down on the object, well, then we need a graph that goes down. And what kind of graph starts by going down? Well, a negative sine wave. Okay, so. If you're given a problem and you're asked to write an equation, you're going to use a positive or negative sine wave if the object starts at equilibrium. And then, depending on if it goes up or goes down, you'll choose a plus or minus. The cool thing about harmonic motion is it's perfectly modeled with a sine wave or a cosine wave. So here's a second scenario. I said there'll be like three sketches. If you're able to write small enough, you can move this one over and draw a spring that's all squished. You see how the spring is all squished? That's because it's starting. It's starting at a maximum displacement. It's starting up at the top. What kind of graph starts up at the top? And of course, 
goes down because that's the only direction it can go. If this thing is squished, it's going to go down. So what kind of graph starts at the top and goes down? Are you surprised? Were you thinking of a cosine graph? Now that cosine graph perfectly models a spring that starts at a positive displacement. That's just a fancy way to say it starts up. It starts up at a maximum. And then of course it goes down. So we have a positive cosine graph. But that's what cosine has always done. And then we get to the last scenario where the spring can start at a negative displacement. All that means is that the spring is stretched out. And if it's stretched out, it's down at the bottom. And again, what kind of graph does that? What kind of graph starts at the bottom and then only has one direction to go? Of course, it's going to go up. Is that what you were thinking? Okay, a negative cosine. Now a negative cosine would be a reflected cosine. That's why it starts down at the bottom and then it proceeds through its periodic nature. Anything that you want to ask about right now? You've seen some things written. You've seen some sketches. Where are you guys at? A lot of times your response is similar. People's response is similar that let's see if we get the idea. Let's see if we can do a problem. Now, I want to actually do the problem that you read about. Okay, do you remember you kind of read about uh, some information Mm, that use some numbers. What we want to try to do is take that information and like figure out what equation it goes into. Okay, so you can look back on page 323 again. You can kind of continue to listen to me. There's definitely the number 10. This is example one, we'll call it. Definitely the number 10 shows up. And as the book said, that's the displacement from equilibrium. Well, that means that the amplitude is going to be 10. So of course, a equals 10. Now again, we just kind of glean that information because we read it and we interpret that that's what the number 10 means. Again, that's the distance, that's the displacement that the object goes from equilibrium. Okay, you can't go through that reading without realizing that the period is discussed to be 4. The period is four. Now what that means is in four seconds, because it's in seconds, in four seconds the object is going to, of course, go through the full oscillation. Now, just like we did many times in this chapter, you can solve for W. You can solve for W. Now, although a decimal is okay, uh, when we're in a situation like this, where we're able to sort of preserve the pi, then that's nice. That That's a little bit more proper. So we can write the answer for w as pi over 2. As I said, the decimal can be okay, but I encourage you to think like this. It makes your equation look a little better. Now, I've read this a couple times. And every time I read it, I'm not sure if it really says what direction the object's going. Okay? It should. It should say the object's going to go up first or it's going to go down. It doesn't really say any of that. So I'm just going to pretend that it said that the object is going to start by going up. Okay? And when you guys get a problem to do, you're not going to have to pretend. 
So let's say that it said the object's going to start by going up. So what we can do is we can choose the positive sine equation, and we can basically write our equation. Our equation uh, for uh, this example will be d equals. Now remember, d stands for the displacement. It's like a y value, but it's the displacement. We know the amplitude's 10, and we found w. And I want you to realize that these equations are quite simple. We don't have to get too fancy with shifts. Okay, we don't have to do a shift. But what we can do is we can use that equation to answer some questions. And I think uh, what I have here, it says use the equation to determine two times that the ball's at equilibrium. So if we want to get two times that the object's at equilibrium, we want to think a little bit about where that would be on this graph, where this would be on the graph. So let's graph it. They should already be thinking, hmm, you know, where am I looking on this graph? Remember, equilibrium is the midline. Equilibrium is the midline. Plus, I just want you to be capable of getting this to work, okay? Because we all know that when you start trying to type stuff in the calculator, that uh, it's not always as easy as maybe it seems. So we have a 10 sine of pi over 2. The way that I typed it in is fine. Sometimes people aren't sure if that's going to be 2x. It's not going to be 2x. It's going to be pi over 2 times x. So I can just type in pi over 2 and stick an x beside it. Now, one thing's for sure is that this thing is in radians. That's just because the W value, the W value is calculated using a, a radian. But the window, let's talk about it again, just like you were trying to do yesterday. The window, now remember, X is not an angle. We kind of left that land. X is not an angle. X is a time. It's seconds. Now, we don't know for sure how many seconds we're going to need, but we have a little bit of a checkpoint. We know that four seconds is a period. I would say to see more than four seconds, maybe three periods, so we could go to 12 seconds. Now, if you're saying that's probably too much, you're right. But I'm saying if we just see four seconds, okay, we might cut ourselves short. Now, the Y window a little different from yesterday. We said yesterday that you kind of get you get a little pass because you don't really know what the Y window is. But today we say we know the Y window. This object's only going to go as high and low as ten. It's only going to go as high and low as ten. Now don't don't stop right at ten. I'm going to go to as high as low as plus or minus fifteen. I've said it a couple times, I just want you to learn the calculator. The scale doesn't matter. Um, I am going to change it to the number one because that will allow the scale to go by one second. So it'll just kind of look nice, but it does not matter. It doesn't change the graph. It doesn't change your answers. Now, as that goes up and down, that's the, that's the spring moving up and down from the little YouTube clip. That's the spray paint moving up and down. What that means is that as you trace along this graph, you can find different places where you are at equilibrium. Okay, now, interesting, as I trace along this graph, I don't get exactly at maybe that x-intercept. Let, let me go over to the first one that would make a little more sense. It, I don't seem to get exactly at that x-intercept. Okay, now, if I'm doing a little bit of thinking, I would say, yeah, but I bet that x-intercept's at 2. So I could always type the number 2 and kind of confirm that it comes out to be exactly at equilibrium. Now, once I get, my, get kind of a grip on that value of 2, it's pretty easy to see that each subsequent time where you're at equilibrium is going to be in a multiple of 2. The other reason I like this problem is because it allows you to understand 
that everything that was said is happening. For example, that a full period, now that you think about it, a full period, that green section is going from zero to four. I mean, that's exactly what we, what it said it had to do. Okay, we can also see that the maximum displacement is happening at one second or down here at three seconds. Okay, so the, the, uh, the sort of the increments of our time are easy to see each second. Is there anything else that I have with that problem? Oh, what's the frequency? What's the frequency? Again, you can think about it multiple ways. You could straight up say, that, well, it's just one over four. It's one over the period. You could also take our W and you could take uh, our two pi and you can flip them over. Uh, if you flip them over, they're just going to cancel out and leave you at the same value. I'm just going to stay with one fourth. That means you go through a quarter of a cycle per second. You go through a quarter of a cycle per second, which is also shown perfectly on this graph. As we kind of said, every second I'm going through, well, one quarter of my rotation. Okay, and I get through four quarters, which is one period in four seconds. Try one. We actually have a problem that um, you don't have to pretend, like all the information's there. It's that buoy on the second page, or the fourth page, I guess. It's a good problem. It's going to make you think about everything we did today to try to come up with an equation. Curious how you'll approach this. Some students right away, they approach it visually, like you're already thinking about drawing a sketch. Do it. Some people approach it a little more algebraically and you're already starting to write an equation. You can do it either way. Now, again, your goal is to write an equation, so it's going to either be d equals sine or d equals cosine. You also have to think about if it's positive or negative. And eventually to plug in the exact numbers for the amplitude and for the period. Now, if you need kind of like a little nudge, this statement about 10 feet from highest to lowest, that's a statement that's going to help you get the amplitude. But the amplitude is not 10. So think about this carefully. It goes 10 feet from the highest all the way down to the lowest. Okay, there's 10 feet 
in that total distance. So that's going to help you get the amplitude. And then this statement here about being basically five feet underwater, okay, that's going to help you determine the equation. It looks good. A lot of you are getting it. Just kind of don't want to give it all the answer yet. Once you get the equation, you can think about a couple of those questions. Maybe you'll graph it. Good. And of course, the frequency clean one half is your last little nugget where you have to figure out how that's going to help you get the period. It appears that there's unanimous here, or just about if I'm as I look around that you guys understand the amplitude is five. Um, that is definitely true. Using the number 10, you can deduce the amplitude is 5. This statement about being underwater, okay, maybe a little bit of a graph can help us to see that if I start underwater, well, then it would have to be a negative cosine. It would have to be a negative cosine graph, and that is also true. Okay, as you start to write your equation, as many of you have done, it's going to be a negative 5 cosine, and then we got to figure out what's up with this W. Now, if the frequency is one half, that means that, and there's different ways to think of this, that means that the, that the one over the period is equal to one half. Now, if one over the period is equal to one half, just by some simple math, that means that the period is equal to two. Okay, so that'd be one way that I could get to that conclusion. But if the period is equal to two, which it is, that means that two pi over w is equal to 2. And we have to take that extra step so that we can solve for w. w equals pi. w equals pi. So when I put that into my negative 5 cosine equation, I'll have a pi t. I'll have a pi t. Is there anything that you want to ask about with how we got the equation? There is so, another way you could think about getting this pi value, okay, using the frequency. Um, I don't mind discussing if you guys need to. When you go to answer the question, um, as I said, you could graph it. You should see a cosine graph that starts down below. You know, you could also just plug in. What does it say there? Seven seconds, 10 seconds? You know, just want you to realize that you've got an equation that um, is able to do simple input output. Uh, trust it. Uh, you know, if I plug in the number seven, negative five cosine of seven pi or pi seven, okay, trust it. The output is the displacement. I'm going to be five units. At seven seconds, I'm going to be five units from equilibrium. Okay, basically that means I'm five units up, up in the air or on top of the water. And then at 10 seconds, I'm back to five, I guess it's feet, not units, but I'm five feet under the water. So you can just plug in input output. Okay, now the homework is on that packet. It's, uh, there's two questions this time. Check them out. Check them out sometime as kind of just a regular daily homework. I could check it on Monday. Make sure that you're ready to turn in the problem set Monday. And then I will have another treat for you. It's a smaller assignment that focuses just on these two concepts on Monday.